going to begin the journey of functional programming on uh, the front end by embarking with Elm today. Now, some of you might follow me on Twitter and know that I enjoy puns, so you might notice one in my title. Uh, But today, uh, instead, what we're going to do is we're going we're gonna to open the trunk of knowledge, uh, get down to the roots of Elm and how it works, and leaf the puns behind. So, and we're, when we're talking about Elm, of course, we're not talking about the mail client. Um, so I'm Brad Griziak, and uh, I'm CTO and CEO of BendyWorks. Uh, follow me on Twitter, uh, much like Hampton Catlin of the Ruby World. Um, my self-esteem is... Uh, correlated well with the number of followers that I have. Uh, so we're going to talk today about uh, Elm for the front end. Why do we care about this? Uh, there are a number of reasons uh, that Elm makes things better. First of all, it's reasonable. And when I say reasonable, it's, it's, uh, I would say that it's easy to reason about. And when something is easy to reason about, it's easy to refactor, because the, the pieces make sense on their own, and they make sense in the larger picture. Elm is also reliable. It's very type safe, although we try to avoid the word safe, because it's a pretty generic term. And instead, what we care about is, uh, is this a reliable thing that we can deploy to production and, and have confidence that it's going to work in the long term? Elm is also productive. You can get a lot of stuff done with Elm, and, and because it's easy to reason about, and because it's reliable, you can write a lot of code fairly quickly and get a lot of things done. And I am a Rubyist by trade. Uh, please don't hold that against me. <laughs> but one of the fundamental tenets about Ruby is that it should optimize programmer happiness. And I think these three things together result in a happy programmer. So I think Elm is worth looking into. So, we're going to look at the, let's talk about the meta uh, uh, pieces about this uh, presentation, about how I'm an advanced beginner, uh, ideally speaking to you as novices coming to the language. If you're very familiar with Elm, perhaps this talk isn't for you. Um, we're also, uh, so then I'm going to get into the, uh, the syntax, the semantics, and the ecosystem, and we're going to talk about uh, the latest release uh, that just came out. So that's really exciting. So first, uh, a little bit about me. I'm an advanced beginner, and uh, ideally I'm speaking to a bunch of novices because it's not a very popular language quite yet. I have a bachelor's of science from, uh, comp uh, in computer sciences from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, I also have a bachelor of sciences in engineering mechanics and astronautics. And this is a picture of me on, uh, quite younger I should add, uh, on the weightless wonder um, also known as the Vomit Comet, but NASA doesn't like uh, having people call it that. Um, and I love teaching people about this, this part of my background. I spent over five years as an aerospace engineer, um, and I've, I've got one thing in space that I worked on, which is really exciting. Uh, it's growing uh, leaf lettuce, um, so astronauts can now grow and eat their own food, which is really exciting. Um, but one thing that uh, my friend Ash says about me is, whenever Brad is drinking, you want to make sure you're sitting next to him, because instead of being obnoxious, he teaches you about orbital mechanics. <laughs> and I think this is a very positive quality in myself. Um, I do enjoy orbital mechanics, and I will teach all that you want to learn. Um, so, so these days, I am CEO and CTO of BendyWorks. We're primarily a Ruby shop. We also do other things like Clojure uh, and a lot of front-end JavaScript stuff. So, uh, but. If you look at my history, I, there's some context here. I'm not a beginner programmer. I've been programming since eighth grade, let's call it, when, uh, when we had Apple IIEs and I was programming BASIC. So I'm not a beginner programmer, but I'm a, a beginner programmer to uh, actually implementing functional programming stuff, mostly uh, coming from the object-oriented paradigm. So when I talk about uh, things that are much more hardcore, uh, functional programming, I get a little lost. I think I'm getting better at it. Um, and so hopefully um, you'll be able to pick up the pieces that I drop. So that's a little bit about me. Uh, the syntax, semantics, and ecosystem. The syntax is uh, what are the bits that validly work together in a technical way. 
Uh, semantics, of course, is how we typically organize those uh, bits and pieces in order to make a, a program that does something that conforms to our idea of what an Elm program should look like. And then we want to leverage others' efforts. And so there's an ecosystem out there to use. And finally, the latest release is uh, 0.17. And I got to say, this is like the most exciting 0.17 release since Enlightenment. Does anyone remember E17? And that thing, I looked it up. It was under development for literally 12 years. And I think that it's not a coincidence. <laughs> I'm just saying. Just saying. So the latest release of 017 was released 17 days ago. Um, and it's a significant release. Uh, if you ever see any tutorials out on the internet, uh, and there are many, uh, that reference mailbox, signal, or address, that means it is pre-17. And uh, while you might learn some things from it, all of those concepts have been completely deprecated. And instead, they've been replaced with command and sub. Uh, also, if you see start app, that is also pre-017. And uh, instead, you should be seeing either app.beginner uh, program, or I guess sometimes it'll be html.beginner program, or just dot program. Um, and also with the 017 release, a lot of the core functionality of Elm was moved from the EvanCZ uh, GitHub re repository to the Elm-Lang repository on GitHub. So if you ever find yourself trying to install a package from the EvanCZ uh, namespace on GitHub and it's not working, um, then perhaps it's been moved over to Elm-Lang. Ev the EvanCZ uh, library or uh, uh, user on, on GitHub still has a number of valid packages that are being kept up to date, just not the core stuff. So uh, speaking of Evan CZ, uh, that's this guy, Evan Japlicki. Um, and Elm is based off of his 2012 thesis. Uh, it basically takes arrowized uh, functional reactive programming, adds some concurrent ML, and it uses some virtual DOM diffing, similar to what React does, except uh, a lot of bench benchmarks put it at faster than uh, React. And that's all interesting, but that's not what we're here to talk about. Instead, we're going to talk about the background of Elm in terms of gradual learning. Gradual learning is built into the language. You saw I referenced the beginner program. There's also a program. So when, once you've graduated from using the beginner program style, then you can go to the, the more complex one. And this makes it actually great for kids because it's built into the language. You don't even need beginner program. You can do just like a static uh, website um, and just make pretty pictures with it, which is really cool. In addition, it focuses on communication. Um, it's got pretty good documentation. I wouldn't say it's the best in the industry, but it's pretty good. Um, and a lot of the documentation in the, the websites try to avoid some of the, the common terminology that makes beginners uh, a little bit standoffish. Things like pure function. You and I might know what a pure function is, but like, what is it really? If you're talking to a group of uh, JavaScript programmers, pure function might be a, a term that they're not familiar with. And so instead, what the Elm community tries to remember to say, instead of pure function, is just stateless function, because that's what it is. And when you say stateless function to a JavaScript programmer, they know exactly what you're talking about. In addition, they try to avoid the word monad. Uh, and uh, with a little tongue in cheek, they just call it callbacks. I mean, they're, they're pretty similar, so why try to confuse the issue? They also try to uh, have a, a great culture. And, it's, uh, and, and when Evan talks about culture, he, he typically means it a little bit differently than what we would talk about here at MoonConf. Um, but it's got a thriving Slack channel, which is a, a pretty good uh, place to learn a, a lot of things. And it's got a style guide as well to make sure that when you're looking at someone else's own program, it doesn't look in a different shape than what you would have written. It's also usage driven, which means that it's kind of a minimum viable solution. And because it's such a young language, uh, Evan is trying to prevent too many concepts uh, from getting in there all at once. Uh, one example is no type classes, or higher kinded types, you might call that. Um, I think this is, this is where I'm stretching here. Um, they don't exist in Elm. 
And Evan is on record as saying, we might add them in 10 years or so, uh, but if we add them now, everyone's going to start using them. And we would rather have that be an advanced feature uh, rather than a core feature. And finally, uh, the technical parts, the tooling. Uh, one of the cooler things about Elm is that it has a semantic package versioning uh, thing that's actually enforced, and we'll get into that later. Um, it's got a, a cool online editor, much like any uh, language worth itself these days has. Um, it's very fast, um, and it's probably got the friendliest compiler in the entire world, and we'll look at that a little later. So. Uh, Let's get into the meat and, and talk about the syntax, the semantics, and the ecosystem, starting with the syntax. So the Elm syntax is inspired by ML or standard ML or OCaml or Haskell. So that, it's got that feel to it. Not many parentheses. I'm sorry if you're, if a, if you're a Lisp fan. Um, I actually don't mind parentheses in Lisp. So. Uh, it's got immutable data structures. So whenever you see something that looks like mutation, um, it's actually not. It's uh, creating a new record or tuple or whatever that's based on the previous one, um, but it actually isn't modifying the previous one. And it has <clears throat> strong type hit checking with inference. And oftentimes we'll put in our own hints to help the programmer understand what a uh, function is doing, um, but it, the compiler will do its own inference. So let's take a look at the uh, hello moonconf program. <clears throat> It's fairly uh, simple. We are importing, or uh, this is, this is uh, basically what it'll show you. It's, it's very basic, right? This is an HTML page with like uh, a text node in it. So let's look at each piece. Uh, first we have uh, import HTML. Uh, and this is just uh, bringing in the HTML package. This would also work with your own modules that you write. So if you wrote something called HTML, it would bring that in instead. Um, it is exposing a method called text. We have our main function, which all Elm programs need to have. Um, and it's just calling uh, text with um, a string. And so text actually converts a string to a text node that's renderable in HTML. So you, never, you can never uh, output a string to HTML without it going through um, some sort of escaping process, which is good. Uh, <clears throat> so this is pretty basic. Um, let's see what it, what it would look like to maybe refactor this a little bit, maybe add some functionality. So we're going to turn that into a greet, and we're going to greet moonconf. And so we'll see uh, here, we're not just exposing a function called uh, text, but we're also exposing um, a module or a class, however you want to call it, called node. Uh, we're, we're giving a type hint here. Um, Something called greet uh, is going to take a string and return a node with some generic type. And so uh, the string is just going to be bound to this variable called uh, whom. And so we're just going to call text. And, and the plus plus operator is, of course, concatenation. So uh, that's your basic function definition. Uh, let's get into let. You can do uh, let stuff, pretty basic, right? You see an if then else. Um, uh, I learned a, a new term yesterday called a uh, gazinta, and uh, we have that as well. Um, so if you wanted to implement rot 13, you could implement it with two rot sixes and a rot one. Um, this is probably a combinator. I, I, don't, I don't know. I think it's a thrush. Not sure about that. Uh, and then it also has uh, pattern matching. So uh, here we have. Uh, we're taking the head of a list, and if a list is empty, of course, that's going to be nothing, uh, or it's, it might be something. And so, of course, uh, Elm, provide, uh, Elm supports you know, the, the maybe monad, which is happening here. So we have either just an entry or nothing. So this function just takes the head of a list or, or a default that you provide. Uh, we can create lambdas, pretty basic stuff. Um, that last one, that I believe that's the K combinator, uh, where it just throws away the right, uh, right uh, parameter and gives back the first one. So um, underscores are, are uh, in functional programming fashion, uh, typically used for unused variables. Uh, we've got some more types, like lists. Um, and we have a record down on the bottom. 
Um, there's also a tuple, which is uh, just parentheses and commas in between the elements. And in order for this to be a, a, a usable language in the real world, of course, we have to have some JavaScript interop. So this is an example of uh, how you might interact with a date picker from, say, jQuery, or jQuery UI, I guess. Um, you define a port, but you don't uh, provide the implementation. Um, and then in your subscription block, which is in one of the more advanced ways to uh, uh, start Elm, you would uh, just have a subscription that subscribes to uh, things coming in from, from that port. And so on the JavaScript side, it simply looks like this. You embed your Elm into your, uh, your web page, and then uh, you would send values to it. And the really cool thing that's happening here is that Elm will automatically type check things on the way back. So if you try to send things that are not int, 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 um, it will throw a runtime error because your port has defined it as uh, expecting int, int, int. So that's pretty cool. And then going the other way, um, in JavaScript, you just write a, a subscribe function that takes a callback in case you wanted to get uh, values from Elm into JavaScript. So uh, I mentioned that it's a strongly typed, uh, strongly typed checked language, so we can define our own types. Um, for the category theorists out here, that means we have algebraic data types. Yay, uh, I guess. Uh, we have uh, type alias, which is, I believe is called a product of types. So these are tuples or unions. And then we have uh, sum of types. Um, below, that's the, the bottom one. Uh, just, that just uses type. And that's a tagged union, for example. Uh, we should all be familiar with those, or disjoint union, whatever you want to call it. Um, and then you can have uh, parameters going into the uh, tag union, and so that, that reason might point all the way back up to a uh, string, and at some point you might change that reason to maybe an int in a string, uh, maybe like a 200 OK, for example. Um, so it's a pretty, uh, pretty reason reasonable uh, way to do types. So. That brings us to the compiler, because the compiler cares a lot about types. Uh, the two ways to invoke the compiler are either through Elm Reactor, which is basically a web server slash compiler put into one. Um, it's usually only used, or you should really only use it for prototyping. Um, every time you refresh the page, it'll just uh, recompile your, your code. And then Elm Make will actually take your Elm code and turn it into JavaScript. And it's the friendliest compiler in the world, because you get things like this. Oh, I twiddled some characters. So it tells you, it shows you where it is. Um, perhaps you meant update instead of udpate. Uh, OK, so most compilers do this. Um, perhaps not this friendly. Um, they're, maybe they're not using the, the, the first person. Uh, maybe you want one of the following, as if it's talking to you. Um, but this is pretty basic stuff. But, uh, and this also works with like functions and not just variables. Um, but it works with types as well. So this if-then-else uh, statement returns a string at the top and a, a number at the bottom. And it, and it very nicely tells you uh, you have a string at the top, you have a float at the bottom, and then it gives you a hint. These need to match so that no matter what branch we take, we always get back the same type of value. That's a very good hint. Thank you. Um, it also works for circular dependencies. It draws an ASCII graph of your circular dependencies. What about recursive data types? Um, if you use a type alias, uh, apparently you can't do that. Um, again, a little beyond my ken as far as category theory goes. But um, if you try to do a type alias with comment, and one of the things is a list of comments, They'll tell you, uh, this would form an infinite type. I can't do this. This is a pretty good error message, but this is only the top half. The bottom half looks like this. And then it gives you a nice explanation. This is a subtle distinction. I suggested the naive fix. But here's a markdown file explaining, or a documentation file explaining what you might want to try. More compilers need to do this. Just putting that out there. All right, so that's the compiler. There, there's actually a repo on the Elm Lang uh, organization on GitHub that is just a, a bunch of files that, that 
uh, failed to compile in order to generate these messages. So uh, you know, calling list.nap instead of map, it'll tell you, oh, I think you meant map. Um, and there's probably around 50 of those examples. So you can play around with that. So that's the syntax. Um, that's the syntax of Elm. And now we're going to dive into the semantics of Elm. Semantics of Elm are based on model view update. Uh, and as you get into more uh, advanced ways of uh, leveraging Elm, uh, that model goes away into an init and also subscriptions. Uh, like I said, it uses immutable data structures. Um, and the basic idea is that all, except for your initial conditions, your initial state, all state is actually black boxed from you. So your update function doesn't actually modify your program. Uh, it's that the Elm uh, runtime takes the, its current state, gives it to you, and says, if I were to give you this state, and I were to tell you this message that came in, what would you change the state to be? And then you give it back what you think the state should be, and then it takes care of changing the state. So this is what a uh, basic model view update program looks like. We're only going to focus on the right after this slide, but on the left you can see we're just setting up model view an update. Uh, so we're going to focus, we're going to take on the challenge of building a counter. It's pretty basic stuff, so why not? So our, our, our model is going to be an int, just going to, you know, starting at zero. Um, and our update, uh, our update consists of two things. Uh, the first thing is we're going to define the ways that an update can happen, and we're going to tell Elm what it should do for each of those ways. So the ways that uh, an update could happen are an increment or a decrement, clicking a button perhaps that increments or de decrements. And then we're going to define what happens when we get each of those messages. So you can see we're, we're using the, um, uh, the, ca the case statement to do that, as, as we saw before. As far as the view is concerned, um, similar to what we saw with ClojureScript, uh, we are defining HTML as code. And so we have a div with a button, a div, and a button. Um, and it just works. So let's, let's take a look at that. No? All right. So there we have our, our, but, our uh, counter. And uh, if we do that, it, it just kind of works. So there it is. <clears throat> no, not print. So what just happened? Uh, we, have the, uh, we have the Elm architecture, and, and this is basically the, the steps that happen. So we uh, define these initial conditions. In our case, we just defined a model. Um, in the more advanced case, we'll also define kind of a command that uh, if we want something to run um, on, on startup, that, that we would do that as well. Elm evaluates the view that, uh, function that we defined. Um, and then waits for the, um, for the next interaction to happen. That interaction could come in through a user interacting with the uh, application, could come from a port like we uh, showed with uh, JavaScript interrupt, and, uh, or uh, a subscription could trigger something. Um, and that'll, trigger, that'll create an interaction message that we defined earlier as a message. In, in our case, it was increment and decrement. Um, Elm will then send the existing model and this new message into your devs, your uh, update function. And then it'll uh, retur you return a new model and optionally a command to do. And then it just loops back into rendering the view and, and going through the, the process again. So that was a counter, right? We did it. Now let's build a countdown, because it's moonconf, and why not? Let's launch something. <clears throat> so in order to do this, we're going to need to step it up and, and move from the beginner program to the regular program. And so it looks like this. Uh, we change the model to an init, and we change subscription, or we add subscriptions. Our model uh, changes to this, where we're not necessarily just defining the model anymore, uh, but we're also uh, defining the initial condition, condition, so a model of 10, because we're going to count down from 10. And we're just going to say uh, we don't need to uh, trigger anything at the beginning. Our update gets a little simpler, because instead of going up or down, we're just going to go down. Um, 
and we have, we're going to look for a tick, and it, that tick is going to uh, come with it um, a value for the time. And then that tick is just going to decrement their model by one. Our view gets a lot simpler because we're just showing the, the time now. And now we're adding something called subscriptions, where basically, as long as the model is greater than zero, every second we're going to send the tick, mes tick message. And so this subscriptions uh, method gets called um, a lot. <coughs> Excuse me. So that, um, you know, uh, when you hit that zero point, it'll, it'll run it again and say, oh, I, I can follow that else path and just uh, provide no subscriptions. So we've basically implemented a glorified set interval, um, which is interesting, but not that complex. Um, so let's blast off somehow. And how are we going to do that? Of course, our, uh, our uh, launch system uh, responds to HTTP, so uh, we're going to trigger an AJAX call to it. I'm not actually going to show all the code for this, but I'm going to go through some of the, the key concepts. <coughs> so, uh, so in Elm, we have uh, two uh, types that help us with asynchronous stuff. We have task and command. And the way I like to think about these is not the, the nouns, but the verbs. So when you approach someone and you task them with something, that doesn't mean that they do it immediately. Right? They're going to get it done on their own time. Whereas if you command someone to do something, they're, they're probably going to do it right now. Right? And so that's the subtle distinction that I, or that maybe the mnemonic that I use. So then uh, what, uh, in order to turn a task into a command, you just call perform on it. So our new types uh, will now look like this. So the messages that we'll get back from the Elm runtime are either going to be a failed, uh, so didn't work, or we're going to get a, succeed, a succeeded message. We're going to maybe extract some uh, string from the response that we get from Ajax. <clears throat> Our initiali initialize is going to post to uh, trigger that, that post command. That post command just looks like this. We're going to perform something. And um, if you're familiar with the result type or the either monad, um, you'll see the left is the failed and the right is the uh, success. Um, and then the thing that you're actually going to do. And then uh, similarly, to define the task, um, we're going to use the JSON decoder. Um, and we're just going to pluck out the, the launched at thing. And then we're going to de decode that into a string. And then we're actually going to post it with that decoder. We're going to post that to our rocket slash launch. And then we're just going to provide it an empty body. Um, and then uh, how we're going to react with the result of this is in our update method. We're going to receive a message in a model. And um, you know if we get a, uh, a failed message, then you know, we have a Matthew McConaughey situation and got a failure to launch. Uh, no? Yeah. Um, otherwise, we're going to uh, put out uh, how, uh, that it succeeded in, in the time that it launched at. So, uh, so that's how we would uh, deal with subscriptions. So uh, that's the semantics. And now let's talk a little bit about the ecosystem. Uh, the Elm ecosystem uh, is consisting of a number of things. Uh, but the first thing that we're going to look at is uh, the package packages that are out there. So some of the packages that you can pull in very easily are um, SVG, so you can draw things on a canvas, um, or, or in an SVG uh, object, of course. Um, there's an HTTP library to do AJAX posts, like, like we just showed. There's a markdown thing to convert markdown into HTML. Uh, there's web, uh, sorry, I'm looking at the wrong screen here, geolocation. Uh, you can probably guess what that does. Uh, there's web sockets. Uh, there's a debouncer. So in case someone is clicking too fast, you can count that as just one click. Um, there's easing functions in case you want to do your own um, easing functions. Or you can use the standard ones like ease in, ease out, um, and apply that to your animations. Uh, and there's a decode pipeline that, that allows you to decode JSON into your records uh, or the proper types. So th there's a huge uh, ecosystem out there of packages. And it's growing by the day. So it's really exciting to see some of the stuff that's out there. One of the other cool things is that uh, it has semantic versioning. Uh, and it's not just semantic versioning. It's enforced semantic versioning. So for example, if you wanted to see the difference between two, uh, two versions of a library, you can just ask the Elm package uh, command line and say, give me a diff between these two things. 
And it'll tell you, well, I've added blob data, and I've removed these two things. And it says, this is a major change. And it's a major change because either something existing has changed or something existing has been removed. Um, and if, uh, if the type signatures uh, were identical, um, and, and you can do this with your own code, right? You can do it uh, before you actually trigger the version change. And it'll tell you, oh, this is a patch change because none of your API, none of your type signatures have changed. Um, or it might say, oh, this is a minor change because you've added things, but you haven't changed or removed anything. And package.elmlang.org will automatically do this and it will disallow uh, packages to be uploaded that have the wrong semantic version update. I think that's mind blowing. I hope you do too. So some of the resources that you can use to learn more, uh, there's just the Elmlang uh, website, but there's also the package. Uh, Guide.elmlang.org is amazing. It's, it's basic, it'll take you through the process of building a beginner program and then building a regular program. Um, there's also elmlang.org uh, slash try, which is an online editor with a couple examples that you can use. There's the Slack that I mentioned. There's an Elm Weekly newsletter. Um, and some of the other things, there's a debug.elmlang. Um, and I'm going to show you one of those things right here. So here's Mario. And uh, so this is, this, is a, uh, this is running on, I think, 016. So this actually will not compile with the newest version of Elm. Um, but what we're going to do here, I'm going to play this. And we're going to use our uh, keyboard to do some stuff. And then we're going to pause this. All right. So because we're not mutating state, but rather Elm runtime is mutating state, it can remember all the states. So you can travel back in time. OK? Also, um, you can say, I think it should have a, a greater um, velocity when you jump. And this is, of course, not working on live demo. So let's try refreshing this. So we're going to play. Jump around. We're gonna go back, and uh, hopefully this will work this time. No, of course live demos. Um, yesterday, when it was working, those parabolas will actually get bigger, um, even if they're in the past, which is really cool. So that's uh, a bit about the ecosystem. So Elm for the front end. Uh, I think it provides a, a great uh, environment to, that you can reason about that is reliable because it's type safe. And it helps you, the compiler helps you be safe. Uh, you can write a lot of code very quickly that does very interesting things. And in the end, we're just all going to be happy about it. So uh, my name is Brad Griesiak. Um, we are looking for our next client. We're also hiring. 